All right, guys. So let's let's get started. So the topic for today's lecture is link prediction. Um, it's the second lecture on uh, well, machine learning methods for predicting within networks. And uh, uh, we're going to define the link prediction problem. We'll talk about various measures of similarity between nodes or proximity measures. Um, and we'll talk about you know, doing prediction using classical supervised learning techniques. I will mention some other methods. I will not go into the details, but um, I'll give you references um, if you're interested. So um, what is link prediction? Well, uh, you know, it is what, what it sounds like. It's a predicting of links. But you can think of several different flavors um, in this problem. So the first one is the sort of time evolution of network. Um, if you have a network that is changing with time, is growing with time, and the formulation of the problem can be the following. Given a snapshot of a network at some particular moment of time, t, predict edges that will be added in their um, time interval t from t to t prime. Um, this is a sort of very, very classical framework, uh, a very, very classical uh, prediction, predicting, far, predictive formulation um, for, um, for the problem, where for, time, for, 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 the, for the problem was time evolution, right? Um, the second type of problem is link completion. So the idea here is um, we have a network and uh, you know, the, some links could be missing. And they could be missing because you know, the, the network came from some observations and we didn't observe those networks, uh, didn't observe those edges, um, or um, there was noise, um, and, and again, we missed them. And the third type of the problem would be link reliability problem. It, it's a problem when we're given a network, um, given all the links, but we're not quite sure if all of them are correct linked. And uh, we can try to uh, estimate the reliability of the data based on the network structure, make sure things are consistent. When we talk about, when we speak about predictions, it's really, you know, there's also sort of several flavors of what we can predict. We can predict the link existence, so yes or no, so it's a binary variable. Um, we can try, and that's a problem, you know, if you try to map it on a um, machine learning, that is a classification problem, binary classification problem, yes or no. Um, we can talk about link weight, which is a regression problem. So we're going to predict that the link exists and the weight on the link. You can also think about link type, which again will be a classification problem uh, with multi-classes multi if you um, expect that there could be multiple types of links um, existed in between networks. And for example, um, if you think about this prediction of the link weight, and remember that uh, you know there is a direct connections between um, graphs and matrices, right, adjacent matrices and graphs, um, say, uh, when we talk about, in general, link existence, um, you can think about, say, social network and, you know, whether people are friends or not, um, and, you, you know, or uh, we're missing that net link or the link will appear in the future. Um, the, the, the good example for link weight would be if you actually have, say, bipartite graph and, um, here it can be um, users and movies, and there are links uh, connecting users to movies, and every link can carry, say, a weight. It is a rating that the user given to the movie, and we can try to predict, um, you know, the, the appearance of, say, a link here, 
and the weight on that link, and that would mean, okay, well, if the user, it, it, it's really a recommender system. If the user wants to watch a movie, what grade the user would give to the movie, and that would be you know, the weight on that link. So, um, in this sense, you know, problem of link prediction is extremely close to this whole recommender um, on problems, problems of recommender systems. So we're going to concentrate today um, really on, on these two uh, types, and in fact, even more on the very first one, um, link prediction. That's sort of the most popular um, topic in, in, in the literature. And in general, it is tightly connected to the ideas of network evolution, right? So how networks evolve and change in time. So, you know, why um, this, I mean, you know, the, the problem seems more or less trivial uh, because it's very clear, the, the setup is very clear. Now, there are some difficulties, and the difficulties are really comes from the following simple fact. Um, imagine that we have a graph, and um, what's shown here on the left side is, is the following. We have nodes that are just sort of red dots, and we have edges that are dark blue, and the dotted line are possible edges, right? And so the idea is that um, we're actually given graph on the right, um, where several edges in light blue, so these are missing, and we need to really recover them or reconstruct them. So there are actually, even on this simple picture, there are one, two, three, four, five, six possible missing edges. And the question is that, you know, looking at the graph structure, we need to uh, select this to, to reconstruct. And the problem here is the following. Um, the total number of possible, the, the total possible number of edges in a graph is um, size of number of nodes squared of that order of magnitude. And so missing edges, well, to be more precise, it's V time, what well, the size of number of nodes, number of nodes minus one divided by two, so that's the total number of possible edges in undirected graph. E is a number, um, the, the size of E is how many edges exist in there. So this difference is how many sort of missing edges, so how many missing spots there that we can fill. And, um, you know, most of the networks we deal with, they are sparse. So this E is much less than um, V squared. And so there are like lots and lots of places we can put an edge in. And so, for example, if we decide to solve this problem, you know, by randomly guessing, um, the, the probability of, of correct guess is 1 over V squared, well, simply because <clears throat> that's the order of magnitude um, of how many edges we can put there. And so with large graphs, graphs it's very small. And so the, the sort of randomized guess of what two nodes to connect, you know, let's say, okay, I'm just looking at this graph. I'm looking at this graph and randomly selecting, okay, let's connect this two, right? There is a very high chance um, of me being wrong and very little chance of me being correct. So just because of that sort of, um, you know, of, of, of those numbers, um, because of, of squared of possibilities, um, that becomes more difficult problem. Though again, the formulation is sort of straightforward. Any questions so far? No, okay. All right, so you know, the, the most straightforward algorithm you can come up with is to really, um, for every pair of nodes, for every pair of nodes, um, come up with some sort of scoring function. Well, that, that was supposed to be a question mark. Okay, for any pair of nodes, come up with some sort of scoring function that will um, calculate well, the, the, the value of the proximity. And um, 
you know, we would assume, again, uh, because we're dealing with social networks, we would assume is those nodes that are in some sense similar, they are connected. It's the same, exactly the same assumption that we've done um, you know, in a previous lecture when we looked um, at uh, label propagation. So um, we'll try to compute you know, some proximity score uh, for every edge, for every possible edge um, in the graph that I'm missing, right? And that's sort of v squared of those scores. Then, you know, we sort those, we, we sort those edges by the scores. And we select, you know, either top n or um, some number about threshold. And we'll say, okay, well, that's what's going to happen. These are the edges that um, are missing. So this is a little bit ad hoc uh, approach, um, but it can be surprisingly um, effective. So, and, and the trick here, of course, in uh, the way how to compute that, you know, proximity similarity score between two nodes in the network. Okay. Um, again, this, um, you know, the, the, we're going to talk more about sort of the social network things. Um, in fact, this method has been used for biological networks uh, to predict um, proteins and genes interaction. Um, we will kind of use this again on, on social networks and uh, have that motivation. So if you remember, um, we talked about it many times that if you have, if somebody has two friends, then, you know, with, with a high probability, they know each other, right? So what, what did you call that property? Well, the fact that if you have, you know, if the node has two friends, then those guys know each other. Do you remember the word, the, the, the term for that? Right, we, we, we said, okay, it was called homophily. It's when, you know, two similar objects connected. So the idea is, um, okay, if you have two nodes and they have a common neighbor, then there is a chance they're connected. But of course, this chance increases if, let's say, um, these two nodes have this in common and this in common and say that's in common, right? So if that's the structure in the graph, there is a pretty good chance that these two nodes are also connected in a social network. Um, and the reason is because that connection will actually close, will create, you know, triangle here, will create triangle here, will create triangle here, will create triangle here, right? Okay, so if for um, if a pair of nodes has a significant overlap in neighbors, so you know they have a bunch of common neighbors, that would actually give you a signal that these two nodes are quite similar and they might have an edge in between them. So um, in both sort of settings, the edge either sort of missing um, for us, or um, you know, it, it's a prediction, if we, if we talk about the prediction problem, an edge could be formed in there. And, and this is a very, very strong signal um, in, 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 in terms of the prediction. So, speaking more sort of precise, what, we, what, what I just described is the following. It's really just a number of common neighbors, and if n, is a neighborhood of n of vi is a neighborhood of node um, i and n of vj is a neighborhood of node j, then what we're doing is we're just looking at the overlap, right? Intersection of those neighborhoods. And we take the number of nodes that form that intersection. So number of common neighbors, that's a very strong predictor. Um, we can also normalize this, uh, you know, creating what sort of traditional Jacquard coefficient 
um, where it would be number of common neighbors divided by the total size of their neighborhood of two nodes, right? Um, surprisingly, I mean, usually people prefer Jacquard coefficient because um, you know it's normalized. Um, surprisingly, uh, you know, in 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 these settings, um, in the settings of link prediction, number of common neighbors works pretty well. And um, here is another metric which is called um, Adamic Adar because that just probably was published in um, in a paper by Lada Adamic, um, and that. Uh, metric for the similarity talks about the following. Say you have, again, we have two nodes, and there is some set um, of overlapping neighbors here, and this is a set of overlapping neighbors. Well, those neighbors actually happen to, of course, be connected further to the graph. And so the idea here is um, the, the metric, the similarity between these two nodes will be based on um, the node degrees of the overlapping nodes. So what this says is the following. We sum over all overlapping nodes, so over these two nodes, and we calculate one over logarithm of their degrees, okay? So which means if uh, those nodes have high degrees, you know, they, they influence less the scoring, and if they have lower degrees, they influence more. So in some sense, what it says, if the node, um, if the these nodes have a very high degree, then um, the connection, then, then they provide sort of less confirmation for the fact that there might be connection between these two guys. But if the node degree here is small, well, that's a very strong indication that, that these guys might be connected. Um, you know, if you, if you want to learn a little bit more about that metric, um, you can look up in the paper. Um, the, the surprising fact is this metric performs probably, it's one of the, the strongest metrics, uh, one of the strongest predictors um, for the existence of the edge. Okay, so those were metrics that dealt with local neighborhood of the node. Um, but, you know, we have the entire graph. Um, and, and so it seems, uh, you know, intuitive that if there is a connection, if there is a path in between two nodes in the graph, so there is this node, and then, then you know, there are some other nodes, there is a path, and there are here are your, your, your new node. So, you know, there is a, some, there is a graph here, and, uh, you know, you, you can trace a path from this node to this node. So, you know, that might be an indicator that they could be connected directly, right? And again, just thinking about, you know, friendship graph where you can, uh, um, you know, people can be introduced through, through friends. Um, that kind of um, you know idea, um, and of course you know the the shorter the path, the, the higher the probability that the two nodes could be directly connected. The longer the path, well, it's probably the less probability. So you can actually you can actually use just the shortest path as an indicator, as a scoring function. But you know you take minus in front of it simply because again, um, it's the shorter the path, the higher the probability. So it's the shortest sort of spot will give you the highest probability. Um, you know, the alternative to it, or to just shortest spot or well, extension to the sort of shortest spot um, computations could be, for example, um, idea of, of, of the cut score. Um, if you remember, we talked about this, the, when we talked about centrality metric, we talked about um, cut score. Um, and over there, the point was that um, it's not only when we measure the, the centrality of the node, um, we take into account not only sort of number of nodes that are reachable um, directly from that node, but we can also include sort of the second level, uh, so the nodes that can be reached through um, you know, two steps 
and, and three steps and, and more. And uh, um, so, so we calculate all the pathways from this node to every other node in the graph. Um, but the, the cut score um, was designed, you know, if you just did, start adding up, the whole thing was just going to be increasing. So the cut score designed the following way. Um, we actually add up all the pathways, but we will dump um, the, the importance of the longer pathways compared to the shortest. And so uh, beta is less than one. In fact, beta is less than one for this thing to work, less than one of a uh, largest eigenvalue of matrix A. Um, but beta is this coefficient that um, you know, decreases the influence of the long pathways, but at the same time, you know, we're adding all possible pathways. Now, when it was original cut score, if I wanted to do a, a score for um, node, say, CI, I will take this and sum up over all possible, um, uh, you know, final nodes. But since here what we want to do is we want to, we want to calculate um, the score in between two nodes, we don't do the summation. And so what happens is here we have node I, And here we have node J, um, and the score, the cut score, calculates for us all the possible pathways from this node to that node. So, for example, it can add it can add uh, pathways like that. It can add this one. It can add longer one. Each of them will come with this factor beta, um, which will be sort of dumping factor. So the influence of longer pathways will be smaller, but the whole thing will add up. And you know that can be recomputed um, in the matrix form. So um, it's you know better than just the shortest path, and um, but but to, to compute it, it's much harder because you either have to do to deal with this inversion. Or you have to calculate lots of lots of sort of sums, um, and there is another version, sort of you know, more advanced version, if you wish, of the Scott score is the idea of page rank. Um, again, you know, we remember we talked about page rank many times, um, and we talked about um, the fact that um, when you calculate page rank, for example, say um, it's it's a, this random walking process, and uh, um, when the, the, the walk is on some particular node, it has a probability of um, alpha to go to its neighbor, or with probability one minus alpha, um, it can, okay, let me put a few more nodes. With probability one minus alpha, it can sort of teleport or jump to any other nodes in the graph, right? And so there was, this two, there was a process that consists of these two processes, right? Um, there was a probability um, alpha go to the nearest neighbor, to random, randomly selected nearest neighbor, one minus alpha to any other node in the graph. And so um, idea um, how to use the scoring function, so page rank gives you the, the, the rank for one node. And here we need um, the rank um, a similarity between two nodes. And so the idea here is instead of this teleportation uh, step that goes to each and every node in the graph, um, we, we allow teleportation only to one node. And so then you have two nodes, selected nodes, um, the node where you allow teleportation, and the node where transition can happen to. And uh, that page rank now carries two indices. And you, know, you can calculate them based on pretty much traditional page rank equation. Um, except for now, it will be everywhere, not one index, but two indices. So it's sort of matrix equation. Now, again, the point here is the following. It is, um, 
instead of you know the, the random sort of hop to any possible page on the graph, um, the hop is allowed to only to one particular page. And you do it for all the possible pairs of nodes. Okay? So it is, you know, it, it's originally was called personalized page rank because um, you know it, it was assumed that or you can think about the personalization in the sense that, um, that the transition is possible to a particular subset of all the nodes of, uh, of web graph and uh, it, it's sort of person specific. So you know when you, when you serve the web, um, you're not a generic person. And so there is particular sort of pages on the web where you would go more often than to other pages. And so for you, teleportation would be there. And so in this case, um, personalized or rooted page rank means you know you 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 will teleport all the time only to one particular page in the graph. So it's going to be a random walk, um, a random walk uh, with a probability alpha, and you know hop teleportation to a very particular page with a probability one minus alpha. Okay, and that sort of um, fixes two pa two pages, the one you 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 get by random walking and um, that sort of teleportation, and so it can establish. Um, this the, the this particular scoring between those two pages, and then you know you gain you consider again random walk, but now you it, there's another page to which you can always teleport, and another page, and um, that gives you scoring between all pairs of nodes in the graph or all pairs of pages. Does it make sense? Somewhat. Okay. So again, the key here is. When we do this type of scoring functions, it's really always about pairs of nodes because you know we need to establish um, the value you know, for the connection between pairs. So that's that's the key, right? Um, you can think about many more different similarity metrics. Um, one of them is uh, sort of you know on the, on the page rank flavor. Um, except for we're not doing teleportation, we're just doing you know random walk on the graph. And uh, you know, in in the Markov chain theory, um, you can calculate what's called uh, heating time, expected heating time. Um, that it means the following: say um, uh, you, you can do it for directed, undirected graphs. Um, it means the following. You know, you start from here and you do random walk, and uh, let's say you know random walk proceeds here, here, and you eventually um, get to this node. It took you three steps to get to that node on on that particular duration, and here is you another run, and now it took you two steps to get to this node, um, and let's say um, I'll I'll add a couple more nodes and. Uh, here is your another uh, well let me connect here um, and here is your another run gives you four steps you know, one two three four five steps to get to this node so there are different number on different runs there are different sort of routes you um, the, the random walk takes to get from one point to another and so hitting time will be average of those number of steps uh, you know, in a sense of uh, expectation, mathematical expectation, um, going through all the possibilities here. And that will predict the similarity between these two nodes. So again, it's somewhat, we, we talked about a very similar approach um, last time um, when we looked at the label predictions. And over there, um, you know, the, 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 we, we talked about this random walk-based similarity for, for label prediction. Well, that's sort of from the same, um, you know, the same type of computations. So there is a heating time. It's how long it takes you to get from node I to node J, um, how many steps. Um, there is a commute time because what might be happening if, is that your graph is directed, and so it takes you a different amount of time to get from I to J than to J to, to I. Um, then there is a version of what's called normalized heating time. Um, that's where you actually calculate this time and multiply by stationary distribution probability when you have it over the over the graphs. Um, so etc. 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 
So you can actually calculate all kinds of metrics based on this idea of random walks. So, but the point here is there is a random walk, and you know, if two nodes are similar, the random walk will quickly discover them, both of them. You start from one node, you quickly get to another node. And if two nodes are far away, far apart in the graph, you know, it will take a long time for random walk to, to reach that. So, I mean, you know, again, this sort of, uh, this is a path-based methods. Um, one thing to remember here is that, uh, you know, the, the graphs we're dealing with, they're small world networks. And in many cases, um, the, the diameter of the graph is pretty small. And that really means, you know, the, you have very few possibilities to, with, with uh, you know, discriminating values with random walks. I mean, you know, in those graphs, in five steps, you reach pretty much from every node to every other node. So, you know, the possibilities here is, you know, one step, two step, three, four. But that's about it. Um, finally, um, there is a Simrank score. We also talked about it previously um, when we looked at the similarity between nodes. That computed recursively um, um, the following fashion. That similarity score between two nodes is calculated using this sum over the neighborhood, and it's normalized. Um, the idea here was, you know, the intuition behind that score was that if you have two nodes in the graph and you start two random walks um, from one node and another node, the similarity score will calculate, you know, how much time on average, how many steps it will take. Well, I mean, it, it, it depends on how many steps it both walks take before they meet sort of that's that was the idea uh, uh, we looked at that back I mean in the previous module um, we look at the type of scoring so in any case um, we have a bunch of nodes and we're trying to sort of the score the, their proximity right trying to score how similar um, they are Oh, okay. And uh, that was sort of obvious pairwise scores. Um, the first sort of type of scores where those, you know, have two nodes and there is some overlap in between neighborhood. The second type of scores we looked at were two nodes and there was some sort of pathway between them. And we just calculate either through random walks or some other way um, the metrics. Um, the third type of scores are uh, actually has to do with their. Um, scores per node, but the scores can be somehow aggregated. So, um, you know, for example, let's say we have for two nodes, we have the node degrees, K, I, and K, J. Um, and we can calculate a mutual score um, that would be either product of K, I, K, J, or say, for example, sum of K, I, K, J, and assign the score um, to this possible edge in between Ki and Kj. So again, here it's a vertex feature. It's not an edge feature. But we combine them, we aggregate them for two vertices that could possibly connect. And um, um, the intuition here uh, could be, a, you know, again, the fact that um, in, in, in Many typical social networks would have assortative mixing, which means you know similar tends to um, similar nodes tends to connect to similar nodes, right? And so nodes of high degree connect to nodes of high degree, low degree of low degree. Or you can think about this as a, this preferential attachment model, um, where again you know nodes of the similar type prefer to it, it, where where the probability to attach to the node is proportional to the node degree. Right, so pro and, the, and that means the probability of connection between two nodes is proportional to the product of their degrees. That's sort of you know in in, in flavor of this Barabasha Albert model, and that's why it's called preferential attachment. Um, or you can actually take say clustering coefficient and say, okay, well you know there is this clustering coefficient for one node, clustering coefficient for another node, um, clustering for one node, clustering for another node. And we can combine them, and the combination can be done through either product or, or, or sum. And that will create, again, 
for us some coefficient, some similarity met metric, um, some score between nodes i and j. Right. So the, the the point here that we always get the sort of scoring between i and j. And so when we've done that, what you can do is you can actually take um, again all the edges, all the possible edges in the graph that exist. Well, that that actually do not exist. Right. So what you do is here is a Here's a little graph. And there are a bunch of edges missing here, um, or but possible edges, right? It could be edge here, we could have edge here, we could have edge here, could have edge here, could have edge here. Um, and so what you do is for each and every of those pairs, um, I'll draw them right here, you calculate, um, you can calculate this type of metrics um, the one of those set of metrics we talked about in the previous several slides and sort by those metrics. Okay. And of course, depending on the metric, you will get different sorting, but you know, you, you choose the metric that you like the best, you sort and you say, okay, well, let's say, you know, top two or three um, in this, um, in this list is that's the links that are missing and that's the links that were, would be established. Okay. So that's sort of the, that's the, that's the essence um, of, of the algorithm. Okay, there is one more point here um, that I probably should mention be before show before showing some results from the papers. Um, um, there is entire large body of literature on uh, uh, low rank approximations, and um, the simplest idea is a single value decomposition. Right? You you probably you all heard about it. Yeah. So you know SVD. Uh, PCA SVD. So, um, so the, the point here, if you think about it, if you, know, you, you take the matrix A and it's being decomposed into um, three matrices and this one is diagonal and uh, you know, you can, if you assemble it completely through the product, you will get matrix A exactly, or you can start taking, you know, several values, um, from the diagonal instead of the entire diagonal, and that will give you approximation to matrix A. And that is also a way to um, you know, get rid of noise. You probably have seen this um, as a denoising operation and, um, and fill in zeros in the matrix A. And um, what's gonna be happening, you know, if, you t if you have a matrix A and it has say, um, you know, um, say I look at the two rows, and then I look at the matrix AK, which is um, truncated version of A. Well, the, of course, the values in those two rows will be slightly different, right? It will be sort of low dimensional representation of, um, of matrix A. And, um, you know, the point is, if you think about, let's say, our original um, scoring system, where uh, we looked, say, at the overlap um, of the neighborhood of two nodes in terms of the matrices. Um, remember that this is node I, this is node J, and here will be all the connections from node I to node J. And let's say if this is a binary vector, and there is, and it's a binary matrix, and so there are zeros if two nodes are not connected and ones. If they are connected, then um, actually, then if I want to calculate the overlap in between neighborhood of nodes i and k, um, what I need to do is I need to take this vector and multiply by that vector. It's a scalar product. Um, that gives me the overlap, right? If if we just have a binary matrix. Well, what you can do is you can, for example, approximate um, this overlap this dot product uh, working through um, low rank approximation of the matrix. And that will be slightly different numbers. You'll get slightly different numbers. Um, you know, supposedly, you know, if life is good, um, then, um, you know, the, 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 you will get rid of noise and, you know, maybe, maybe recover some latent variables that um, help you to compute those, that, that will do better job. Um, and you can actually apply this kind of low rank approximation 
um, you know, to, var to various computations. You can actually use it to just calculate um, the similarity between two vectors, the way I just shown, or you can just use the sort of matrix um, low rank decomposition and then uh, pretty much ran anything you want in terms of similarity on this um, low rank um, approximation to the matrix. So here is here, here are some results. Now, um, these results are from the paper by Lieben, Nobel, and Kleinberg. Um, the, I think the original version of the paper, um, the conference version, was 2003 or maybe 2004. Um, and then there is this journal version several years later. Um, they pretty much organized um, this, this entire sort of subfield of link prediction. Um, and this paper became sort of the, the reference paper um, to all the link prediction algorithms. Um, I, I actually described this paper in the previous slides. What they did is they looked at um, this various uh, ranking functions, various um, similarities metrics, and tried to do uh, predictions based on those. What's interesting to notice on this picture on the slide is the following. First of all, here is the baseline with respect to which we're going to look at all the prediction. It's a random predictor, right? So which means you know you just randomly you're just randomly trying to guess um, which node is there and which no I'm sorry which edge is there which is not there. And and then there is a bunch of methods. So here is common neighbors. Here is your page rank. Here is Jacquard similarity. Um, we're not, we haven't talked about this bigram. So here is a sim rank. Here is a graph distance. Here is a heating time. Um, here is a cuts clustering. Um, here is a you know weighted cuts, and that's weighted cuts probably almost what we did. And there is um, Adamic Adar um, coefficient. And uh, um, here is the quality score. So uh, you notice that Adamic um, Adar, Adamic Adar gives you the best uh, performance, give you sort of the best quality of prediction. Again, remember, it's um, what we do here is we use we score by particular um, particular type, right? We score by um, you know this particular similarity metric. Um, we're not using them all together. Um, it's just scored by one of them, and um, it, you know it seems like this one does the best job. Um, you know we can we can use say the you know the one of the most obvious metric will be common neighbors. We can use them as a baseline, right, and see how better predictions are from other methods um, compared to this baseline common neighbor predictor, and. Uh, um, again, notice that Adamic Adar is probably uh, you know it, it's the best in terms of the different you know in terms of this gap um, on average. You know the cuts clustering is gives you a lot of variance in here. Um, you know rooted page rank is very close to common neighbor predictor. It's kind of funny because. Say to calculate page rank, it's a lot of computations, like really a lot. Remember, we need to run page rank, iterative process, matrices. Um, while you know, neighbors is common neighbors is you know trivial calculations. It's just the neighborhood of the node, and it happens uh, by looking at the results that the, the prediction predictive power of both common neighbors and say you know rooted page rank is almost the same. Um, by whatever reason, you realize that you know Jacquard is little worth, um, and again the sort of uh, graph distance with a lot of where you, you calculate all the pathways, um, where we calculate. I'm sorry, the shortest path is not such a strong predictor, and hitting time is also. So um, that gives you sort of an idea that if you want to do the prediction, you know edge prediction in the network. Um, you're probably better off just, you know, calculating um, <laughs> common neighbors for two nodes and using that as a predictor. So these triangles are extremely strong predictor. The fact that, um, you know, when 
um, that the fact that that you know this edge exists strongly depends on how many triangle it will close when it is formed eventually. Um, and uh, um, the, the other way is, of course, you know, the, the, the strongest signal here is from um, Adam Mikadar, um, which is also can be easily computed. Um, it's a local metric. So um, that's sort of the, the big picture. Now, um, it's, it's kind of obvious next step that what you want to do is, um, you know, if you want to gain more out of this, you might want to take all those features, I mean, all those scores and use them as a features in some machine learning technique and that will allow you to combine them, right, and take the best out of them. Now, doing so, you have to be careful because um, you realize that they, they are kind of dependent, right? Um, for example, it's clear that there is a dependency, right? There is a correlation, will be correlation between Jacquard and um, common neighbor prediction because Jacquard is common neighbor, just normalized. And, uh, you know, it's clear that things like, you know, page rank and heating time um, and seam rank might be very sort of have similar behavior simply because they're all based on the idea of random walk on graphs. Um, and you probably remember it from the machine learning course that when your features are correlated, you have to be uh, careful with machine learning um, methods you use, right? So linear regression will not work that great when you have correlated features. Um, but other than that, you know, sort of that's, uh, that's definitely a next step to do is to take those features and combine them to all together. Oh, uh, and here's one more slide. I forgot about it almost. Um, this is uh, the same type of testing, but done um, uh, with, um, yeah, it doesn't say so. So, but this is a test done uh, for a reduction. Uh, so for using um, UK, SK, VK, right? Using reduction, using subspace projection um, to calculate similarity between uh, between uh, two vectors and uh, um, you know it, it just test ran on uh, various data sets and um, this is a quality of the performance and this is a size of the subspace so you take um, the, you know the graph or the matrix which is you know thousands of, of nodes and you know you select subspace you do low dimensional embedding um, you do SVD and um, you know, eventually what it looks like that you know, in many cases um, they get the best performance. Um, say here is the best performance, right? Here is the best performance in, you know, for the data. Here is the best performance. Um, here is the best performance where dimensionality of the space is somewhere you know, uh, either 64, yeah, around 64 gives you, give them the best performance, except for uh, you know, this data set where by whatever reason, um, you know, the lower subspace you go, the better, right? So um, what conclusion can we make from this? Uh, I guess um, it, it just tells you that, yes, um, um, you know, the, the low dimensional embedding can help you, can give you better performance of the algorithm, but it's really on a case by case basis. Overall, you know, the size of this sort of 64, again, in their experiments, seems to be the magic number. But um, it, it's hard to generalize on all possible data. At the same time, you know, it doesn't hurt to try if you can do that. So um, back to our classification problem. Uh, what are the challenges in actually taking all those metrics that we calculated and using them as a features in a classifier to do binary classification. Well, there are sort of two obvious problem, problems. One problem is just the sheer number of uh, possible edges, right? Um, as, we, as we talked already about it, it's V squared, where V is the size of the number of the nodes in the graph. And so uh, we need to evaluate all those pairs um, to, you know, to, to use that as a predictor. 
them, right? And uh, just lots of them. Um, but the second more um, you know, important difficulty, a more subtle difficulty, is the fact that when you try to build a classifier, you need to have positive examples and it have you know, negative examples. And uh, when you later on classify things, well, you have positive and negative. Well, the problem here is we have hugely imbalanced situation. We have lots and lots of negatives, which means uh, majority of the possible majority of the possible uh, edges, well, they just do not exist, right? And they do not exist rightfully. They shouldn't be there. And there is a small number of uh, positive, right? So there is a huge sea of negatives. There is a small number of positives. And when you train a classifier with this imbalanced classes, it's very hard to get a good classifier out of it. And, and the reason for that, do you know the reason why it's, it's, it's hard to, to get a good classifier if you have an imbalanced class? Have you looked at it at machine learning? So if you have two classes and one class is dominating another class, which means you know um, you have a bunch of examples and there are only a few positive examples and there's a sea of negative examples. And the same distribution is in the training set. And of course, you know, when you start, when you need to score something in a, in, in a test set, <coughs> you still have the same very, very unbalanced distribution. Um, the difficulty here is the following. Um, since you're going to be scoring lots and lots and lots of um, cases, and majority of them are negative, for classifier, it's much easier to just call the entire world, give this entire world a negative label, and that will give you almost better scoring than trying to cherry pick um, on, on small number of positive examples. And that's why sort of anomaly detection is very difficult and training with um, imbalanced classes is very difficult. And so there are ways to do that. Um, there are methods to, to handle it. For example, you can try to downsample, which means you can try to sort of balance this into, okay, instead of just taking the whole thing, all negative examples, you know, you take just samples from, from them, a few samples, and create a data set that are more balanced. Or you can up so you can downsample or you can upsample, um, which means you know you take all the negatives, but positives you take multiple, multiple times repetitively. And so that will create, um, again, much larger uh, positive and negative data set. So it's all kind of sampling that can help you in here. So in our case, it means the following. You do have, again, um, when we try to look at the graph, and edges between um, and edges between nodes. Negative in this case means missing edge, and missing edge. There will be many more of those missing edges um, compared to existing edges, right? Because there are quadratic a number of missing edges. I can start drawing these missing edges. There will be lots of them. There are many more of those that present edges, and that means negative class will be much, much larger than positive. And that means for a classifier, it's going to be very, very hard to train on this. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the real difficulty in here. Um, and I mean, of course, computational costs too, but um, sort of from the theoretical or idea perspective, um, you need to deal with this imbalance in classes. Um, did you guys talk about this imbalance training, training with imbalanced classes in machine learning? No. OK, but you still have machine learning class running right now. Yes? Yes. Excellent. Well, ask. Ask to learn about the, you know, how to classify with imbalanced classes. So it's when you have many more positives than negatives or many more negatives than positives. So one of the solutions is you know, downsampling or upsampling. Downsampling um, dominating class or upsampling the class that um, have fewer uh, represent representatives, but there are many more ways, um, you know, to do this. Um, 
example of these problems are everywhere. It's anomaly detection. It's, uh, say, when you try to do, uh, I don't know, when you try to analyze reviews, uh, uh, you will have majority of reviews will be neutral to positive, and a few will be negatives, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in real life, it's actually rare to find uh, balanced classes to do classification. Um, and, and so here we're talking not just sort of, you know, 10 examples of one and 15 examples of other. We're talking about 10,000 examples of one type and, you know, 100 examples of another type. So that's, that's, that's the sort of the main challenge here when you do classification here. And actually, oh, um, here, yes. Let me ask a question uh, about uh, cross-validation uh, in this problem. Serge uh, Karayev uh, 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 did some uh, research on this uh, problem. We discussed uh, uh, such idea uh, about uh, how to make um, uh, train and test uh, sets uh, for this problem. Uh, and the idea is following. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, usually you have, you have some graph and you uh, need to construct sets of uh, uh, positive and negative links to uh, train your classifier. Uh, and to split the, uh, in train and test. Uh, the idea is following. Uh, you can uh, uh, take a graph uh, um, Leave, leave, uh, um, and, uh, leave one page out, uh, uh, calculate your metrics uh, on it, and, uh, and randomly add one of the uh, negative pages. Uh, and you can repeat this procedure uh, uh, at least uh, uh, the number uh, of pages you have. Uh, and uh, uh, this this way uh, enables you to construct a uh, 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 set of machine learning uh, which consists of two times a uh, number of edges in your network. And uh, uh, the question is: Is this approach uh, correct and uh, uh, can be used for uh, training such uh, uh, such algorithm? Algorithm is. Yes, so um, yeah, the cross-validation is a traditional way to, I mean, one of the traditional ways to do it. What you're talking about is, it sounds like, uh, you know, one out cross-validation when you, um, you know, remove one node and you try to, and you train on, on, on you know, you use that as a, as a prediction. Um, for the prediction, typical cross-validation is what's called tenfold cross-validation where you divide your, your test set into ten, um, Buckets you use nine for training no, no, no. for prediction and rotate between them. Does it make sense what I said? No. Yes, but uh, idea not in, in that. Uh, idea is uh, to construct a set which we uh, uh, to be uh, cross validation. We need to construct a set uh, and, and balance the set uh, uh, with uh, positive and negative edges and. Uh, uh, for example, if we uh, split, uh, but if we split, for example, our graph uh, in ten parts, uh, in ten parts, uh, it will um, uh, uh, lose some of its structure. Uh, the idea is that if you leave one page, uh, it um, uh, the uh, structure of the graph uh, remains uh, almost intact. And uh, it, uh, 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 but it, it's not a really one out cross validation. You can you can do really one out cross validation or constructed uh, set by by this technique. Maybe I'm not explaining it right. Okay, um, I mean it. It sounds you know doable what you're describing. Uh, you know it's hard to judge from you right now. Uh, we can take it offline and talk more about it. But you know yes, you can definitely you know play different games. Uh, constructing training and testing sets, right? You can, you know, use one edge. Um, you can randomly subsample things. Um, you know, it's 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 really all up to you. Um, there are some sort of traditional approaches which are, um, you know, tenfold cross validation or you know, leave one out cross validation. But and nothing prevents you from sort of your own way of you know, creating your own way of doing so. Okay. 
Um, all right, so back, back to our story. Um, this is an example, and actually, in fact, um, this is a very interesting data set. It's sort of used by lots and lots of uh, researchers. Um, this is a data set of, uh, collaboration, of collaborations um, of uh, different authors um, in, in scientific papers, right? And uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's a good set because um, there are a few things happens here. Well, first of all, there is a very strict timeline, right? Um, there are papers published in 1995, and the papers be, keep being published, published, and the people finding more and more co-authors. And so the data set is really about co-authors of the papers on, on the scientific publications. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that driving co-authorship, of course, uh, but the question is, well, can we, by looking at the graph, predict who is going to write a paper together, right, in, in, in the future? And, I mean, you know, again, it sort of makes sense if there are two people, you know, two researchers here, and they previously were co-authors with, you know, say, with this guy and with this guy and with this guy. Well, there is a high chance that they eventually will be co-authors on the same paper, right? And so this graph evolves. You have timestamps on, on, on the edges appearing in this graph, which means you know, papers written by several people together. And so it, it's, a good, it's a good set for, uh, you know, for, for the prediction problem. Now, the difficulty is shown here on, um, you know, on this graph is, again, this notion of possible collaborations. So these are all possible edges, which means you know, it's sort of you know, v squared number of possible edges that could exist in the graph. And this is the actual collaborations that happen in the graph. And this is the growth of the possible, and this is the growth of the actual collaboration in the graph. So the number of existing edges, the number of possible edges. Now, you know, looking at this picture, it doesn't look that scary, except for this is a logarithmic scale of millions of collaborators, right? And this is point 0.1, and this is goes from 100 to 1,000, 10,000 and this is an so um, the, the difference in between number of uh, positive actual collaborations which are positive examples and possible collaborations is you know three four order of magnitudes um, and, and that what makes this problem uh, difficult and in fact you know the further you go here in time the, the bigger is this um, is this gap okay so speaking of, um, you know, link prediction with supervised learning, so we realize that the difficulty will be with imbalanced data set, uh, but there are methods to, to deal with that. And, you know, overall, what do we do with features? Well, first of all, we generate features, then we select a model we're going to train, and that can be, uh, you know, anything you want, starting from logistic regression to, you know, naive bias to um, SVM, uh, decision trees um, and uh, an ensemble based methods like random forest etc so you can actually train whatever you want as long as you have as, as you know as long as long as you have features and then you do the testing right I mean in traditional sort of um, all traditional uh, settings now um, in the real situation, um, you might want to use different type of features, right? So we talked about this topological proximity features, which means really using the structure of the graph as a predictor. Um, but you can also use, um, you know, as we, as we did, as we discussed before, aggregated features, which is, say, you know, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the node degree, um, the clustering coefficient per node. So it's aggregated features mean it's a feature per node, uh, but you can easily combine, you know, features for two different nodes to have the aggregated feature for two nodes. And then you can definitely look in the content-based features. Um, you, you know, you, you build a co-authorship graph. Well, you do have the papers those people actually wrote. So there is a content um, to, to, to this connection, right? You know that the one person writes papers on... Uh, uh, on psychology, another person writes papers on economics, the third person writes papers on biology, the fourth writes papers on mathematics. So um, it can also help you 
Um, it can also be a feature in a classifier because you know there's probably higher chance than somebody um, you know who writes mathematics that he writes uh, with somebody who writes on physics or economics, and there's maybe you know less chance that he'll write a quarter paper with somebody who writes papers on music, you know something like that. So content, if you have it, it's it's also very important. Um, you know, for the sake of sort of simplicity and, and uh, you know, pure approach, we're not looking at the content here, but, it, you know, it should be obvious that um, when you try to build sort of real world thing, um, you need to look at the content as a feature. Now, for a classifier to work, the features have to be discriminating or discriminative, actually. Uh, not discriminating, discriminative. Oh, which means the values of the features should be different for positive and negative examples. If they're not, uh, you know, that's not a feature, right? So some feature you know, should be large for positive examples, small for negative example, or other way around. Um, it cannot be the same. And, and so here is an example of several features um, for the data sets. Here is a graph distance um, as, as a predictive feature. And um, oh, and on the top, here is uh, negatives. Here are the positives, which means here are the links, right? So the links exist, and here are no links. So uh, I mean, of course, when the link is exist does exist, uh, the, there is a lot of, I mean, well, most of them will have a distance one, but there also can be, you know, longer distances sort of way around. Um, if you look at um, the other feature, we didn't talk about it, delivered current, um, you know, it's, it is connected to random walks. The idea is you can put a sort of current into the network and, uh, you know, put a plus and minus like a battery and calculate um, how current is distributed. But the point is, um, you know, for, for positive examples, here's your distribution for negatives, okay, here. So they, they, they are different, but maybe not that much, so there is a still overlap here. Um, interesting that if you look at the, for example, the cut score, um, there is a pretty strong um, distances, so you know they're they're separated. So cut score can actually be a very strong predictor, um, you know, positive versus negatives. It makes sense what we're doing here. Yeah, we, so for features, to use features, you need to look at pretty much, if you can, look at every sort of feature and see if the feature can be discriminative for, for, for your case. So if the feature takes a, you know, different values for positive example, negative examples. If the feature takes the same values, um, you cannot use that. I mean, well, you can use it, but it's not going to help you a lot. So. Speaking of, you know, about evaluation and, and building, you know, the, the, the training and testing sets. I mean, you know, the, the simplest thing you can do is you have a graph and, um, you know, you, you can uh, hide you know, some edges, right, and try to predict it. Uh, that's sort of probably the, the most straightforward thing you can possibly do. Um, you know, especially if you do not have a time evolution. Things are more interesting when you have a graph that changes with time. And this is an approach that, you know, usually used um, when you have, when you try to do sort of time prediction or evolution with time. And, and so the idea here is, is the following. Um, you take, so you take some moment in time, okay? And um, you sort of fix it and you look at the structure, you see all the connections. And um, there is a labeled data, there is a connection here um, that appeared uh, by that time. Oops. Then you fix that and that's your training set. And you're trying to predict um, in the future the appearance of the new edge. And the old edge that you know, used here is, is in there. So, so the point of this is what you do is you take a fr time frame window that tells you about the past and um, then you have this today where, you know, your, your 
um, new nodes, your new edges appeared, and you shift it forward. And then you're going to predict in the next interval. So you have a setting where you, know, you have a bunch of nodes. Um, you can train on the labels that appeared within the next time interval. And that's your learning phase. So to learn something, you, you have this is your training data. This is your label data. So you have a label data in this time interval. Here is your training data. Um, you calculate, you train the model on the setting, then you take this sort of this, the, this, this whole interval and shift it with time forward. And then, you know, the, all the data uh, becomes training data and you can predict into the future. The, the, again, this is sort of very, very traditional approach to this, um, to this prediction, prediction model. And when you do prediction, um, you know, you need to measure the, the quality of the prediction. Traditionally, it's either precision recall or true positive rate, false positive rate, ROC curves. Um, are you familiar with all that stuff? I assume you are. Yes. Yes, you have seen ROC curves. Cool. So here's an example for predictions. Now, uh, again, because uh, this, this is a very much evolving field right now. And, um, you know, I, I, there, is, there are several, several reviews, but there is no sort of single place um, or single large review paper that would have, that would test all the possible, uh, you know, data sets and all the possible methods. So the results here are sort of mixed and, and taken from different papers. So here is a paper um, by Hassan and, and co-authors, 2010. Um, two databases, one database, second database, both of them are actually co-authorship. So these are uh, co-author databases. It's, again, people writing papers together. Um, research publications. Um, they tried uh, various. So what they did is they sort of used um, the, the large set of features, those we have seen, um, and they tried different uh, classifiers. They tried to look for different classifiers. You know, usually you look at the say, accuracy or F value. You can look at squared error, um, whatever you want. Um, you know, if you look at, at this, for example, F value, um, so the, the best is begging, well, begging um, um, the, you know, I'm actually, I don't remember which algorithm they used to sort of you know, to do to do the bagging on which algorithm they did the bag they did the bagging um, the bootstrap aggregation. Um, it's probably decision trees, um, but so that pr gives you the best sort of performances. Um, you know, SVM not bad, but not the best. Um, you know, on the other data set, if you look at the other data set, you know, the performances are um, you know a little worse. But here, um, you know, actually SVM um, does pretty good, good, pretty good job here. So, you know, give or take, um, some algorithms do better than others, uh, but it, it also depends on the settings. And again, this is very sort of typical for a lot of machine learning problems um, when you have a lot of features, good engineering, good engineered features, um, you know, the algorithms um, do not give you that much of a difference, though um, I should say that in many cases, you know, the algorithm of choice would be ensemble method um, that will, um, you know, reuse the variance, um, reuse the bias, um, and um, sort of things like random forest. And in fact, um, here is um, another study. This is a, from a different paper. And here, um, I believe they use random forest as a classifier. Uh, but they also compare, this is ROC curves, right? And you remember with ROC curve, um, you know, the, the, the further you are sort of here, the better, right? So your, your best thing is you're there, uh, zero false positive, you know, one for true, true positive. Um, so the, 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 the higher you are, the better. So what's shown here um, are the following ideas. Um, they used two different data sets, and one of them, this data set, are, is a co-author data set. Um, this data set is actually a phone call data set. 
They're both time evolving data sets. Um, so you can use a, the, um, sort of phone calls in, a, in one year and predict phone calls for the next year or next month. Um, for condensed matter, it's archive, uh, condensed matter archive papers. And um, here, this n, n equal 1, n equal 3, n equal 4, is because they have huge data sets and huge networks, they actually start looking at the number of the hops of the nearest neighbors from um, you know, the node you do, um, you, you look for prediction, you look for connections. It's either two hops away you're looking for connections, or three hops away, or four hops away. So they sort of simplify this. Instead of looking, going through all the possible pairs, they only look for um, connection on that sort of distance, on a, on a smaller distance in the graph. Um, and of course, their performance in predicting those, and, and I mean, they use it for trading and for testing, and of course, their performance on predicting the connections for the like, nearest, you know, on, on a smaller scale, on closer to, to the person is the highest. And, uh, you know, there, 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 there are some sort of things that are obvious from this graph, which is very interesting. Let's say, um, if you look, if you look, um, okay, what color is not used here? Um, okay, if you look, say, at preferential attachment, which is this, this line, right? It's almost, I mean, it it's even works in like in, in, a, in a wrong direction, right? It's, it hurts your classifier. Um, while in a, in a case of condensed matter, in a case of co-authorship, it actually does help. Um, now, the, so, uh, maybe I should use different color. So this guy, right, it, it hurts the classifier. Here, it actually it does help the classifier. So um, what is the reason for that? Uh, it, it's sort of obvious here, because this is a phone network. And... Um, you know, there is no reason in the world um, that, you know, the, the person who, who receives, you know, when, he, when it's sort of usual phone calls, right? You call your friends. There is no reason that the person who receives more calls will receive even more calls. Or, uh, and then that's why that, that, that feature doesn't work well here. While in, in the feature, um, in a co-authorship graph, well, yeah, a prolific writers, you know, tend to write with prolific writers. So in this case, the feature is, is important. So you can actually look um, and study a bunch of the features and see how they affect the performance of the classifier. Um, we looked at, and, and again, you look, if you look carefully, the um, Adamic Adar is a pretty strong feature. Now, there is a feature that dominates all the, uh, all the graphs here. Uh, it's in this red right there. It is um, their own feature that they created, uh, prop flow. Um, the feature is really one of the version of sort of personalized page rank. Uh, it's sort of random walk type of feature. But I mean, you know, they published a paper. They, they needed a feature. So the, the contribution of the paper is this really, really cool feature that sort of dominates other features. Um, but it's actually a very interesting study. So you can actually see, um, uh, you know, how different features contribute to the ultimate um, result, prediction result. And there are more methods. Um, I, I, I'm leaving them out, but last time you guys asked about the probabilistic models. So here there are also a bunch of sort of probabilistic approaches. There was um, the local model, local <coughs> mark of random field model. There is a hierarchical probabilistic model, and, and there is an entire body of works on um, probabilistic relational models where you where you model your network as a Bayesian network and um, you know you try to calculate um, based on the sort of on, on, a, on a factorizing probabilities um, the, it, it's a very different approach it's also quite successful um, you know it's a little bit more computationally intensive so a little less scalable um, but you know if you're interested worth looking at it so finally, um, here are the references. Um, if you read just one paper out of all those papers, read this one. Um, it's a John Kleinberg paper on um, sort of the, the whole thing we started the lecture today, the whole thing that started this link prediction problems. Um, and um, there are sort of, this is a newer papers that probably worth also looking at. 
And there is a review which I didn't put here, but it will be on our website, um, the one you can read. That's pretty much it for today. Um, any questions? Okay, those guys who are busy didn't even notice that we're done. Uh, all right. Um, 